31-year-old Ryan Edward Nixon dead with stab wounds inside an apartment. A neighbor who lives at the complex told us their community is pretty close-knit and is still in shock by the whole incident. Ryan Lamb was uncontrollably emotional, screaming, yelling, crying, just wailing. They determined that for safety's sake, he needed to be handcuffed and removed from the scene. They could see blood on the doorstep and on the landing. There was blood on the bed, blood on the floor. On August 5th, 2018, Ryan Cody Lamb made an urgent 911 call to the Kalispell Police Department, reporting that he found his partner deceased at home, stating his partner couldn't be revived. 911 to location of emergency. Hey, 306, 306, two mile drive. My boyfriend's unresponsive. Um, okay, I had some post foods inside of himself, and he's like, I put him in the shower to revive him. He's unrevivable. Please help me. Please, please, please. Maybe, please, 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 the Kalispell Police Department responded promptly to an apartment in Flathead County on Two Mile Drive following the 911 call. Upon arrival, they discovered 31-year-old Ryan Edward Nixon deceased in the bathtub. Immediate investigations followed. Surprisingly, the initial suspect detained was the 911 caller and Nixon's partner, Ryan Cody Lamb. Our case starts in the early hours of a Sunday in Kalispell, Montana. At 3.30 a.m., the Kalispell Police Department arrested Lamb. I need to cover him. Where is he? She. What are you doing? She. They're doing what they're doing. Yes. What are, what are you doing? I'm trying to pull up my pants because they're falling down. And I'm like, I need my man. Okay, come here. Yes. Walk with me. Oh, my God. Who, who, is, who is that guy to you? That's my husband. That's your husband, okay. Yes, I just got off of work like 20, 30, 30 minutes ago. Okay, where do you work? I work at the Rivals. Yes. Oh, Rivals? Okay, yes. stand right here for me. Yes. Oh, my God. Face my car. Yes. Face my car. Thank you. Oh my goodness! No, baby! Oh my gosh! Please, please! Uh, in there. Fifty-eight. Is that what's that? Uh, it's Struble. So have a seat for me. What do you mean, it's or, That's my partner, Struble. Can you please? I need a cigarette. I need a cigarette. Or anything. I just walked home. I just got oh. off the clock. Okay, what's your please. name? Ryan. Ryan, what's your last name, Ryan? Lamb, L-A-M-B. Okay. No, I need to check on my husband. No. Please. Not, not please. right now. What do you we're, mean not right now? We're gonna send medics in. No, what do you mean? We're sending the medics in. Please, you okay? Ryan, Lamb, please. We're gonna do everything we oh can. Oh my God, I okay? tried everything, please. Yeah, we're gonna, we're, please. what do you mean you tried everything? I tried some CPR, I tried breathing, and then I ran to the gas station to go for help. Okay. We don't have a phone. Yes, yes. You have any weapons on you, Ryan? Absolutely not. I have a um, a money. Oh my gosh! Tell me. Can I please turn this I way? Just need to... I'm sorry. That's my husband. Please. I just came home like 20 minutes ago. No. 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 You just came home 20 minutes ago. What time is it? It's about a quarter to four. <laughs> okay, Ryan, just have a seat. Yes, sir. Universal precaution. Oh my god, my husband. Please. That's my husband. How long have you been married? Three years, please. Please. Okay. It just came home. Okay. Well, the medics are here, so they're going to do what they can. Oh my gosh, please. Can you scratch my ear? Please. Oh my god. I slapped him and he wouldn't even breathe. And he tried chest compressions and he wouldn't breathe. And I tried to breathe into him and he wouldn't breathe. Like, okay, so so Ryan, here's my parents were at the hospital. Like, this is. 
<laughs> oh my god, it's my husband. No, no stay, stay in the car. I'm not leaving, please. Please, tell me. Tell you what? The, the medics are in there right now. I can let you know when I know, but I've been dealing with you. After viewing the body cam footage of Lamb's arrest and his visibly distressed reaction to Nixon's death, it's understandable to question why he was handcuffed. It was evident to observers that Lamb was deeply affected by his partner's loss, making the arrest seem questionable. Detectives later explained they wanted to remove the grieving partner from the scene. This has led some to speculate there could be more reasons behind the arrest than initially apparent. He is overwhelmed by what happened. The footage shows him repeatedly calling out his partner's nickname, Bubba, in distress. Lamb is so upset that he vomits, prompting officers to give him a trash can and water. Eventually, he calms down slightly, still clinging to hope that his partner might have survived. Sadly, Lamb will soon get a clear answer about his partner's fate. <laughs> no! Learning of his partner's death plunges Lamb into deeper trauma. It's challenging to understand why the Kalispell police decided to arrest him, given his condition. While it's common for detectives to consider the partner as a suspect initially, Lamb's extended detention raises questions. The situation is filled with uncertainties, but the most pressing question remains. Why did the police keep detaining Lamb, who was grieving over Nixon's death? The reason for Lamb's arrest became apparent during his intense interrogation. Initially, the questioning was challenging for the Kalispell officers, as Lamb struggled to accept his partner's death. However, amidst his grief-stricken statements, he mentioned something that could potentially contradict the story he had consistently told throughout the night. Lamb claimed his partner was killed by an ex-boyfriend, identified as David De La Rosa, a blunt contradiction to his earlier statements where he claimed ignorance about the incident. With this new murder theory presented, officers attempted to dive deeper into De La Rosa's involvement, but Lamb's intoxication, admitted earlier to involve beer and weed, complicated the interrogation. Lamb's state presented challenges for the officers as they continued questioning him. After gathering all possible statements from Lamb, the initial officer was replaced by a plainclothes detective, Jim Wardensky, who led the investigation. With Lamb somewhat calmer, Detective Wardensky resumed the interrogation, aiming to extract useful information. However, he eventually stepped out, allowing the original officer to return. This officer then informed Lamb about the discovery of his partner's blood on him and expressed the intention to collect a DNA sample to check for any traces of David De La Rosa's blood mixed with Nixon's, aiming to verify Lamb's account. The officer persuaded Ryan to undergo a BAC test, which showed his blood alcohol level was significantly high, ranging between 0.08 and 0.40%. In the United States, a level above 0.08% is legally intoxicated. Such levels can lead to confusion, blackouts, and nausea, clearly indicating Ryan had underestimated his alcohol consumption when he claimed to have had only one beer. I noticed you kind of some uh, Ryan's blood on you. Yeah. Trying to... Yeah, it was, um, I tried to revive him because okay. he was fucking spitting blood out of his mouth, and so he said he was fine, and I ran to Michael's to go get the phone. And I called my mom who works at the hospital, I called my dad who works at the hospital, and then I called the f***ing hospital, and they said, call 911, and I said, yes, I need to run back and check on him, and I'm calling 911 right when I get back there. Okay. I didn't think about it, I'm sorry, I was, I just no, got no. off of work, it's no. fight night, you don't need to like, I worked my f***ing off tonight, I like, right. <sighs> all, all I was getting at Ryan is because his I had a... Like, because the bullet is on you, we would like to collect that blood. Oh my god, but I have to read it. He had, like, blood pouring out of his stomach, and I plugged it, he said he was fine. Go call the cops, go call your dad, and I ran to Michael's, and I should have gone to Jean's next to her. I didn't think about it, I was, I was still a little intoxicated. I'm sorry, this is just a lot to be processing right now. And I knew this is dangerous. And okay, Ryan, so what we're going to do is we're going to read you uh, uh, permission to um, search form for 
uh, biological stuff, the blood on your hands and stuff. Yeah. The reason that we're concerned is based on what you're telling us, there's a potential that uh, this David Del Rosa's blood is intermingled with that, okay? And if that's the case, we want to collect that stuff so that way we have it as, as evidence, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So, um, Officer Venezio is going to fill this form in quick and then he'll read it to you. And uh, this is crazy. Can you please call my dad and my mom? We'll get to that. Please. Yeah, we, we got some critical steps here that we need to take first. I, Well, that's kind of why we wanted the breast sample from you to determine how much you had to drink tonight to yeah. see. You want to try that again? The PBT, the breast sample? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, uh, a pint of vodka and two tall beers, maybe, and uh, whatever they gave me over at the gold dust. And that's when I made it home. After the Michaels, where I tried to buy it. Oh my god, no. Here you go, Ray. Deep breath. Tice over the straw on both sides here, quick. What is it? Don't you know? Can you please call me that as mom? Um, yes, well, I can, we'll get to that. Point six three. What is it? Point one six three. After completing the alcohol test, the officer moved on to conduct a DNA test. Despite being visibly confused, Lamb cooperated with the process. Your shirt there looks like you got. Well, it's from the other night. Okay. The other night. Okay. And, and did you have an injury on your stomach? Oh, no. Okay, because the other officer said you had what looked like maybe a cut mark on your stomach or something? Nothing on the stomach. Okay. What are those marks from? Uh -huh. When the officer took Lamb's DNA, he noticed stab marks on Lamb's chest, but Lamb dismissed them as just a rash. After completing the test, the officer read Lamb his rights for an official interrogation. Considering Lamb's high intoxication, some might argue it would be more humane to wait until he's sober for questioning, ensuring he can understand and respond properly. In many countries, police guidelines suggest waiting until an individual is sober before conducting an interview. Yet. There's no law preventing the questioning of intoxicated individuals or using their statements in court. In the U.S., if you've read your Miranda rights and acknowledge understanding them through a verbal yes or even a nod, all statements made can be used in court, regardless of intoxication. This practice is somewhat supported by the saying, the drunken man sings an honest song. Lamb began to reveal more truthful information in the following hours. The formal investigation started with Detective Wardensky informing Lamb that he knew about his and his partner's relationship history, contributing to Lamb being a prime suspect. Before Lamb disclosed anything significant, he restated his earlier admission about drinking, this time stating he had been drinking heavily and using drugs. Lamb stuck to his initial account of discovering Nixon stabbed upon returning home. Lamb's narrative began to show inconsistencies when he accidentally revealed being with Nixon earlier, contradicting his previous statements of not seeing him until he found him fatally wounded at home. This slip eventually led Lamb to confess that he and Nixon had been in a fight. Have a seat for me here. I know this is very upsetting for you, and, and uh, Officer Venezio and I want to talk with you and get to the get to the bottom of all this. Okay, Ryan. Yes, sir. Like I chatted with you a little bit earlier, um, we have a process that we have to go through in order for us to get to the bottom of all this. So I'm going to read you right now what's called. Um, your rights. Okay, I started them a little earlier, but I'm going to finish here just knowing what rights you have talking to us. Um, oh my god, okay. you guys are just going to hear me. We don't know what this is. Oh means. my god. We don't know. Sorry. And and Ryan, here's the thing, okay, is that um, we have to be cautious because, because I, I've dealt with you and Ryan before when you guys have had disputes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so we just want to make sure that we cover all of our bases. I understand. You know, and and um, certainly, you know, as if it were my significant other, 
that something bad happened to, I'd want to do everything I possibly could I, to help out, right? I just want to get out of here so I can get <sighs> Well, we don't want that. That's our job, okay? So let me read this to you. But you can help us. So this says, I do hereby make the state, following statement to Officer Benizio and Wardinsky, the Cowsville Police Department. Knowing that I may have an attorney in my behalf present and that I do not have to make any statement nor incriminate myself in any manner. I make this statement voluntarily of my own free will, knowing that such statement could later be used against me in any court of law. I declare that this statement is made without any threat, coercion, offer of benefit, favor or oh, offer of favor, God, Brian. leniency or offer of leniency by any person or persons whomsoever. Do you understand that you have the right to remain silent? Looking for yes or no's here, okay? Do you understand you have the right to remain silent? Yeah. Do you understand that you have the right to talk to a lawyer for advice? That if you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed for you before you are asked any questions if you wish, and that you have the right to have the presence of this lawyer while you're questioned. Do you understand those things? Yeah. Do you understand that any statements you make or anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law? Of course. That was yes, sir. Yes, no. Yes, sir. sir. Do you understand that if you decide to answer questions now without a lawyer present, you will still have the right to stop answering these questions at any time, and that you also have the right to stop answering at any time until you talk to a lawyer? Do you understand these things? Yes. All right, Ryan. The last one says, "I understand the above and I'm willing to make a statement." Thank you. Thanks for being willing to talk with us. Of course. Look, I know who Like, I just want to get the out of here so I can get this person. You guys are going to do enough to him. I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't know. enough. So, Ryan, I know that you've told the other officers kind of what took place, but uh, I'm sorry I wasn't there for that. Can you tell me from start to finish? Oh. Uh, kind of, you were at work? It's It was fight night. Okay. Oh, I've been drinking. Okay. Like, sometimes we drink at work. Okay. But I love what you were doing. Okay. So I hung out extra late, and I know I should have got f***ing you know. what, what time did you leave work? Oh, um, I think I clocked out around uh, 11. Okay. And I didn't leave there until I don't know. Like, I hung out for two tall beers. Quite a bit of vodka. Okay. Who was the bartender tonight? Uh, Lexi, um, Kenny, and um, Cardia. Okay. <laughs> All right. And I hung out and I smoked a bowl with one of them. Sorry. No, we're, we're not worried about that right now. <laughs> Okay. And then what happened? Uh, I went to Michael's. Okay. Um, the gas station, the um, the gang song. Yeah. Um, bought some food. No. Yeah, bought some food. Okay. Sorry, like you drank a lot, like yeah. What what kind of food did you buy? Um, I bought some tea. I think some donuts and some jerky. It's what Ryan likes. Okay. He really likes the jerky sticks. Yeah, and then. I went over to the gold test to see who was working. Yeah. Took a drink more, I'm sorry. Okay. You're 21, right? You can drink. <laughs> uh. Okay. God, no, please. Hello, Mr. Please tell me. So, I'm, uh, what about after the gold? Go 
Amarantos, muito pouco. Uh. And you got cross speaking. This is you play two trouble, can you get stoned and you throw up a lot and okay. really it spins? Okay. And where was that now? It was outside the cold dust, um between Teletech and um, Little Caesars. Okay. Where'd you head after you got sick? I barfed a, a, a few times okay. in the, the field. And I took a knee, smoked a couple cigarettes. But Brian was like, He was in front of me for like half an hour. He... I'm oh, sorry, I missed this up there. So when did you meet up with Ryan? I don't know if it was the gold test. I'm sure it was when we were smoking up the wall. Okay. I really sorry. Like, like, I'm... You don't need to apologize. You're going through a horrible time right now. Okay? You don't need to apologize. Give me a second. Take a second. Um, We've been fighting because we've been leaving the house unlocked so I could get him. Okay. So I don't technically live there. I just stay there without the limit or knowing up until tonight. Oh. Oh. Around an hour and a half into the interrogation, following Lamb's inconsistent statements, the officer shifted the conversation back to the marks on Lamb's chest. Lamb then offered a completely different explanation from his initial claim of them being just an old rash. He stated that the marks were the result of a sexual encounter with Nixon the previous morning. The officer observed that the marks resembled those made by a fork, which led to further inquiries about Lamb's sexual relationship with Nixon. Tell me more about the, the marks on your chest there and your stomach. Can you unbutton your shirt so I can see that? What's that from? It looks like a fork. Yeah. What's it from? Well, we just really fucked up sex. It was fucked up sex. Okay. It was up sex. How old is that injury? Oh, uh, this is... Not yesterday morning. The morning before. So Friday morning, and, um, it went. For the clothes, it got off at 11. So, yeah, like Friday at like 9. So, let me tell you a story, okay? Yes, All right. And, I, the reason that I'm going to share this with you is because um, over the course of the last 20 years that I've been doing this job, um, I've seen a fair amount of things, okay? Not too much shocks or surprises me, okay? Um, a number of years ago, I went to a call. Uh, some folks that typically would not call us because they didn't like the police very much. And uh, the The male half um, had a stab wound in the back of his, on his back there. And uh, when we were trying to sort things out, um, they both explained that during sex, uh, their, what they had heard was that if you inflict a little pain uh, during the sexual encounter, that it intensifies things, okay? So we like to like put belts around each other's necks when we're fucking. Um, sometimes we um, um, better drill each other and then take video. Okay. Um, sometimes we would uh, immobilize, like completely restrain the other one. Um, and it's nothing to like, get woken up 
um, having some rough sex. Uh, that's what we're into. Uh, sure. Oh my god. So the fork marks. Oh my god. Uh, tell me about that. Uh, I'm on the top. And, uh, right at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I let them top me, and it has to be painful. Uh, or I'll freak out and stop. Okay. So the more pain that I get, the more it allows me to be a bomb. Okay. Did uh, did you ever did he want pain ever? Or? Aside from uh, a rough fucking not a whole lot. As Lamb's inconsistencies increased, his credibility faded, signaling to the Kalispell police that they were nearing the truth. The situation worsened for Lamb when officers revealed their review of security footage from the apartment complex, which showed Lamb but not David De La Rosa, whom Lamb had accused. It was established that De La Rosa was actually in Libby, Montana, far from Kalispell, at the time of the incident. Confronted with this information, the officers shared their theory of the events with Lamb. Despite beginning to sober up, Lamb stuck to his initial narrative, though he slightly adjusted his story. I think that probably you guys had an argument. And I think because of the alcohol consumption and maybe some other factors, things got way out of hand. So wrong for that. Okay. Well then, help me figure out what's going on here. You know, it's not David who determined that. Okay. Okay. So help me figure out what took place. If it's not you and it's not David, you literally separated at Gold Dust or Michael's. Um, he walked home. I went into Michael's and bought more food. Um, And your neighbor lady confirmed that Brian came home first. She was outside. She saw him come in first. And then uh, I came home and seen blood on the, pat the patio thing. And the door was open. And I went in. And he was bleeding. And he was sitting there. He gets all the laundry against that wall that separates the kitchen from the living room. Somebody at one point told me that you had claimed you tried to resuscitate him. Yeah. Okay, tell me about that. He started barfing a lot. And the blood, blood was like all over, like cut out the back of his head. And I just pulled the scissors and I put the sponge and I wiped his chest and I held it on the... He had a wound on his chest and I held it over it and I was holding him. And he kept coughing, and I was breathing into him, and he said he was fine. And I ran over to Michael because it was the first thing I could think of. I was, I'm sorry, it was like, fucking intoxicated, half stone, but. So if you were that out of it, how do you know you didn't do that? I can't, I know. It's a legitimate question. I guess so. Because um, I, I love my husband so much, and I want him. Want him. I, I don't doubt any of that, Ryan. 
I don't doubt any of the stuff that you're telling me that you say you saw the blood, you had a cut on the back of his head, you pulled the scissors out, you put the sponge on there. I don't doubt any of that stuff. Because I remember walking home, I remember like, seeing this stuff, I remember fucking talking to Ryan, like panicking and panicking, and like, what do I do? And so you go call for help, and I'm so, do I call my mom? Just call your dad. Like, I mean, he was fine, like he was fine. He was barfing and he was fine. And I left the sponge with him, and I ran to fucking Michael's. I put on that TV shirt, I put on the shoes, and I ran to fucking Michael's. No. Okay, so tell me, tell me why you had to put a shirt and your shoes on. I was laying on my house panicking, I didn't have shoes on, so I slid my shoes on. And the TV shirt I was already wearing, it was unbuttoned, and I took it off when I got there. And I ran out to him. And I didn't know what to do. Like, I didn't know what to do. I've never seen this shit before. He was just bleeding from the back of his head really bad. And I pulled those scissors out of his tummy. With some headway in the interrogation, officers provided Lamb with a sleeping bag to rest. Meanwhile, Officer Wardensky returned to the apartment complex to interview neighbors, indicating his skepticism towards Lamb's version of events and his expressions of grief. Despite suspecting more to the story, Wardensky lacked concrete evidence to implicate Lamb, understanding from experience that without a direct confession from a spouse, the law treats them as innocent. Until proven guilty, Wardensky was determined to uncover definitive proof against Lamb, committed to not ceasing his search until he found it. Upon arriving at the apartment complex, Officer Wardensky inquired with neighbors about any observations that could clarify the morning's events. The first two neighbors provided no helpful information. However, a breakthrough came with the third neighbor, who provided a disturbing account. This neighbor reported hearing a fight from Nixon's apartment, indicating both men were present. Crucially, the neighbor described hearing one person scream, You stabbed me in the chest, followed by another voice responding, You stabbed me in the chest first, with a fork. The neighbor's statements gave Officer Wardensky probable cause to pursue charges against Lamb. Upon returning to the station, he informed Lamb of the impending charges. This move might seem as if Lamb was being charged with deliberate homicide, potentially used as a strategic fear tactic. Such an approach could be aimed at nudging Lamb towards disclosing the truth. Whoa. Whoa. No way. Yep. Oh my gosh. Yep. So if there's anything that you're not telling me, now's a good time to be completely honest about it. How would that make it better right now? Would it change that? Well, again, you know, I've I've offered up I, several scenarios. I understand. Like, is this something that I should talk to you, like, talk to a lawyer about first? Or? That's completely up to you. Experienced detectives often highlight the effectiveness of law enforcement interrogation techniques in breaking down even the most resistant suspects. After being detained for eight hours, these methods gradually cornered Lamb, leaving him with unresolved questions and unprovable allegations. Now mostly sober and recognizing the seriousness of his mess, Lamb understood he had no escape route. Confronted with this reality, he decided that his only viable option was to reveal the truth. I got carried away a couple times a while ago. Uh, like, it, we ended up really hurt. <laughs> I mean, we were trying, we were doing cigarette burns on each other and he got way more carried away. Okay. I couldn't get my hands out, so that was kind of like stop this for a while. Okay. Uh, it ended up hurting me a lot more than he had wanted, and so that it just, she's crying. Yeah. I don't think any of the pokes were the little poke wounds. I don't think any of those are the ones that are like threatened. So the the scratches on his arms, there was like two or three scratches on his arm here. Uh, was that from last night then, or this morning? Yeah. Okay. And, and how did that happen? We did those scratches. 
he was poking me with the fork. And it was getting hotter and hotter. And it got me really hard right there in the nipple. Okay. Like really, really hard. Okay. He was gonna he wanted to use the scissors on me. And I was too scared. There were three pokes in them. Okay. And one on the nipple the one startled me the most. I don't I don't remember that one. Like when it was dead on the nipple, it startled me most. Why did it startle you? Cause it, like the fuck tip it ran on the nipple. Okay. It's, I'm not startled, that hurt. I mean, it hurt a lot more than what was happening. Sure. Um, but that witness, or uh, that um, statement from that neighbor. It was, it was consensual. It was a consensual thing we were doing. Sure. It was just taken to extremes when we were trying to be sexy. Okay. I don't know if you got. I poked him too hard and he hit his head or if I poked him in the back of the head, I'm not sure. I, okay. I'm trying to based on that. Just it's a deliberate homicide then? I don't know. I don't know. You know, I mean so so you said that he wanted to use the scissors on you and you said no. So then you used them on him. I let him use the fork on me. So okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, and then uh, you used the scissors on him, mm -hmm. and where where did you, you said that, where did you poke him at with the scissors? I think the first one was like right here. Over the side of that. Okay. Just the safe spot. Yep. And I think we got this belly fat. Right here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So then, do so the deal on the back of the head, how do you think that happened? I don't know if it's from him falling down and hitting the wall. Like right there where um, when you walk into the kitchen. Yep. Okay. I, I think I'm really trying to No, I get it. Yep. So what, what kind of clothing were you guys wearing? Yeah, it was underwear on. I had a basketball shorts. Okay, the ones you got on now? Okay. So how did the blood get out by the front door? How did that happen? He got up, was like looking for me. Okay. Well, I didn't leave him. I didn't leave him in the shower. I didn't leave him anywhere near the bathroom. Like I, I it was right there by the clothes, and it was just like so much blood, and then it started like getting really like just on the back of his head right there. I thought he had like banged his head or maybe had poked him in the neck or something. <laughs> Do you recall poking him in the neck? No. That's like, no. He's already like, sh he's already fucking really drunk, so I don't know if he like, like, oh, I fell and hit his head. Do you think maybe it could be an overdose situation? Because of the pills, or I don't think so. I mean, certainly we'll do a toxicology. I don't, don't you know. think so. Okay. So based on that, is that still a little bit homicide? Then? So I'm going to have to call the county attorney and run those things by him and see what he has to say. Okay. Would you do that for me and let me use the phone to call just my dad? Yes. Just my dad. I might Absolutely. have to call my aunt. Yep, that's fine. Right. They're traveling together that's right fine. now, but yep. Do you know what happened to the scissors? I really don't. Like, I really, really don't. Okay. How about the fork? It's in the apartment somewhere. Okay. All right. Do you remember what the scissors looked like? Mm-hmm. Okay. They were well, they have like whiskey ones. And I saw those in the bathroom, but they had some like black stuff on them or something. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like blood, it was like maybe you had been using it to clean out a pot pipe or something, you know, like. Those were the only, those were the only, um, how big were they? Pretty small. Um, and then the ones were black and like this. Okay. Okay.
There's the phone. Yep. You I'll run that by them. Absolutely. We can be. Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Okay. You promise you're not tricking me to get some information. Like, I really. This is such no. like an accident. It's gone like so bad. Okay. <laughs> is there anything that you're leaving out that you haven't told me? I don't think I was being entirely truthful at the beginning of this because I didn't want it to look like. Like, the, what are you charging me with? Like, deliver. So, I think I was panicking and, like, just so scared of that. Yeah. So how did the glasses get broke that were on the floor? Then the TV get tossed and all that. Oh, the TV was off by the time I or off the thing by the time I got in because I was behind. Like I came into the apartment like 15 minutes maybe after Ryan got there. Okay. And we were just frisky, but the TV was already down. Okay. Um, the glass uh, that broke like when I was on the phone with 911, like I was panicking, just running in and out of the house. Okay, there were like, two broken glasses. I think they're like High, uh, High, Highland or whatever beers. Yeah. Yeah, and so those were those were right in front of the TV this morning, or on the side of it. Okay. But the TV was the TV was knocked off um, when I got in there. The glasses were, and I think I knocked those down. I think I kicked that picture. Uh, and the bowl that was laying over there? I don't know about that. Uh, Could have been on the windowsill, like I tore through there really fast after like he wasn't responding. Okay. Not like tore out of there, but like tore over like started just pounding on doors and nobody would pick up. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> my mama. Okay. Let me get the phone for you, okay? Thank you. The Kalispell police got a confession from Lamb after a nine-hour interrogation, knowing the complexity of sex-related homicides. Following his confession and allowing him to make calls, Lamb was arrested for murdering his partner, Ryan Nixon, after 11 hours of questioning. On August 5, 2018, Kalispell police arrested Lamb for Nixon's murder, charging him with deliberate homicide after investigations and interrogations. Detective Wardensky concluded Lamb fatally wounded Nixon with scissors during a sexual encounter, stabbing him three times in the abdomen, one strike piercing the sternum. Instead of seeking immediate help, Lamb left to call his parents from a convenience store, wasting crucial time that could have saved Nixon. Lamb pleaded not guilty, and his trial began on June 3, 2019. After 11 days, the trial for the deliberate homicide charge against Ryan Lamb concluded on June 14, 2019. His defense argued that Lamb acted in self-defense, fearing for his life as his partner attacked him with a fork. Emotions overflowed in the courtroom as members of the victim's family testified. Lynn Nixon, the victim's mother, addressed the stand first, questioning Lamb's character and condemning his actions. What kind of person are you? He would have never done this to you. Shame on you. Honestly, shame on you, Ryan Lamb. She then paused, highlighting the absence of sympathy or regret from Lamb, and emotionally noted, My son is in an urn at my home, and that's all I have left. Following Lynn Nixon's testimony, Randy Nixon, the victim's father, expressed his unfathomable grief and disappointment. None of you have a clue what we're going through. Sometimes, I don't even know how I feel. We all tried to help you. I just don't know how you can sit there with your attorneys, how you made us go through this. Amber Nixon Peterson, Nixon's sister, then addressed the court, emphasizing the strong presence of friends and family in the room and defending her brother against claims of being abusive. Look at this room. It's filled with his friends and family. For people to say Ryan was abusive is ridiculous. 
He was always the life of the party. You used my family, especially my mother. She gave you a roof over your head, food and money to gamble, and you never appreciated it. You brutally stabbed him. That's not love, that's hate, that's rage. During the hearing, a significant turnout of Nixon's family and friends showed their solidarity, all wearing shirts proclaiming, Justice for Ryan Nixon. The only testimony in Lamb's defense came from Patty Kennelly, a mental health worker who encountered Lamb at North Valley Hospital in February 2018 following his suicidal feelings. Kennelly, who met with Lamb on five occasions between February and mid-March of that year, and again on the day of the incident at the Flathead County Detention Center, shared insights into his emotions. He has had a lot of contradictory feelings. He loved Ryan, but he felt he wasn't going to survive the relationship. Ms. Kennelly further stated that she perceives Lamb as non-threatening to society. When questioned by Flathead County Deputy Attorney Allison Howard about Lamb's potential threat level while under the influence of alcohol or drugs, Kennelly replied, not to anyone except himself. In his final testimony, Lamb delivers a brief statement. Sometimes, I wish I had let him kill me that night, but I defended myself. I have no desire to return to Montana. I'm not a threat to anyone or society. I have no more faith living here as a gay man than I did in the 1990s. Despite the convincing statements and evidence presented during the trial, presiding judge Robert Allison and the jurors struggled to reach a definitive verdict. As mentioned earlier, sex-related homicides often pose challenges in defining and proving guilt. Additionally, the defense's portrayal of Nixon as the abusive partner, supported by the marks on Lamb's chest and a neighbor's witness statement, further complicated the case. The evidence indicated Lamb sustained 16 wounds from a fork allegedly inflicted by Nixon, who was absent to defend himself. Furthermore, some jurors believed Lamb's actions warranted charges of negligent homicide rather than deliberate homicide. During the deliberations, Detective Wardensky expressed his trust in Judge Allison's judgment while emphasizing the importance of finding peace for the Nixon family. Reflecting on the investigation, Wardensky expressed pride in their efforts. After 13 hours of deliberation, the jurors could not reach a unanimous verdict. Initially voting 8 to 4 for not guilty, the split later shifted to 11 to 1. With no consensus emerging, Judge Allison declared a mistrial. The Flathead County prosecutors filed an amended charge of negligent homicide, alongside the original charge of deliberate homicide, on August 1, 2019. The amended charge contends that Lamb's actions or inaction led to the victim's death due to simple negligence. Lamb pleaded not guilty to both charges on August 21, 2019. After various legal proceedings, Lamb chose to plead guilty to the negligent homicide charges through an Alford plea. In essence, Lamb maintained his innocence, but acknowledged that the evidence presented by prosecutors could potentially persuade a judge or jury to find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. By doing so, Lamb aimed to avoid the harsher penalty associated with deliberate homicide, which could result in 10 to 100 years in prison. The district court approved Lamb's plea, and a sentencing hearing occurred on February 12, 2020. Lamb received a 10-year prison sentence for Nixon's murder. Presently, Lamb is serving his sentence in Montana's state prison. The complexities of the case made it understandable why both the jurors and the presiding judge struggled to reach a conclusive verdict. Lamb's case provoked various interpretations. Some, like his defense, saw Lamb as acting in self-defense, while others, echoing the prosecutors, viewed him as an abusive and depraved killer, potentially deriving some disturbing form of sexual gratification from the stabbing. Remember, it's your curiosity that fuels this channel. Keep exploring, stay inspired, and join us for more amazing content next time.